دکتر شادمان شما تشریف دارین الان تو برنامه آقای دکتر شادمان صدای منو دارین استاد مصابی شما میخوام برنامه رو شروع کنیم بعد من صحبت میکنم میدم بس خانم دفتر اشرف Hello everyone, my name is Marjan Yagmai. I am Associate Professor of Medical Genetics at Tehran University of Medical Sciences and Head of the Leading House for Iran North America Academic Partnership. I'm truly honored to be in your presence today, introducing the first session of How I Treat Hematologic Malignancy Series. As you might be previously informed, How I Treat Series are educational programs planned by the Leading House of Iran North America Academic Partnership And each of these programs try to provide information on basic knowledge and clinical experience related to treatment of a disease or an aspect of a disorder. We hope that the session are practical for students, fellows, and attendees in each clinical category, and how I treat hematologic malignancy studies, as a matter of fact, have brought Iranian hematologists a great opportunity to maintain an academic relationship with Iranian American experts in their field and have created an atmosphere in which clinical expertise can be shared and discussed. It's a great privilege to announce that Dr. Mazia Shadman, Associate Professor of Medical Oncology at the University of Washington is our invited speakers for today's webinar. I am very thankful to Dr. Shadman, the Tom's Vice Dean for Educational Affairs of International Campus And an, uh, and an invaluable members of Appraise to Race team for their great help and support. We are so grateful for all of the contributions Dr. Shadman had made to this program. I should state that the certificates of attendance will be donated to the participants who are present for more than half the time of this session. Here I pass the microphone to our moderator, Dr. Farzana Ashrafi, hematologist, oncologist, and associate professor at Isfahan University of Medical Sciences to provide you with some introduction of our invited speaker, Dr. Mazia Shadman, who is the best support of this series of the university. Thank you. Dr. Ashrafi, please. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us and participating in this area. I'm Dr. Farzan Ashrafi, hematologist from Isfahan University of Medical Science. It's my pleasure to moderate this session on how I treat CLL. Uh, thank you to Tehran University of Medical Sciences for bringing us this opportunity. We have live question and answer, and please submit your questions. All questions will be reviewed and answered at the end of the session. Our honorable speaker is Dr. Maziar Shadman. Dr. Maziar Shadman is MD and PhD, is an associate professor at the University of Washington and Fred Hush. He's a hematolo hematologic malignancy expert who specializes in treat treating patients with lymphoma and CLL. Dr. Shadman is involved in clinical trials using novel therapeutic agents, immunotherapy, CAR T cell, and stem cell transplants for the treatment of lymphoid malignancies. Dr. Shadman received his MD from Tehran University. He finished an internal medicine internship and residency training at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland. He completed his fellowship training in hematology and medical oncology at University of Washington and Fred Hodge. Dr. Shadman also earned an MPH degree from University of Washington and was a fellow for the National Cancer Institute's Cancer Research Training Program at Fred Hodge. 
where he studies cancer epidemiology. He is a member of NCCN guideline committee for CLL. Dr. Shadman, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Akshafi, and also Dr. Yagmai and Dr. Musevi. It's my pleasure to talk about CLL today. And uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Uh, so uh, let me see if you see my, my presentation mode. Uh, you should see my slide in the presentation mode, correct? No, I cannot see your slides. Hmm. So you don't see my slides? It says it's sharing, so. It hasn't been shared yet. It may take a while. Um, okay, let me. Let me try one more time. It's okay, we can see your slides now. Oh, you can? Yes. Oh, huh. I just stopped sharing. So maybe I should, I don't see my, uh... this doesn't make sense. Let me do it again. Um... Please let me know when things change either if you see or don't see, because I started all over again. We can see your slide, Mozia. But go to the slideshow mode. Uh, OK. Is it, what do you see right now? Yeah, it's OK. Is it in the full screen, or is it do you, do you see two? No, it's full screen. OK. Sorry about that. It sounds like 18 months into the pandemic, we still don't know how to use Zoom. So um, it's my pleasure to talk about CLL. Uh, I uh, I thought about what what type of uh, presentation to prepare for today's talk. Uh, I'm well aware of some of the access issues to to the new CLL drugs, and uh, but I still thought it's important to kind of give an update on what's the current standard of care and what's the current evidence-based uh, practice for CLL. And I will try to leave uh, hopefully a lot of time at the end. So during the Q&A, we can talk about maybe some more innovative ways of using these agents, considering the fact that uh, some of our patients, unfortunately, in Iran may not have access to the drug because of the high cost and, and things like that. So. This is actually very similar to the talk that I will shortly give to our for our board review, for example. So I did include uh, many slides, as you will see from the two meetings that are happening actually this week. Uh, ASCO uh, meeting was just uh, last week, and the eHall meeting is currently ongoing. So some of the very updated uh, information that they were presenting at the meeting, and including today and yesterday, you will see in these slides. I, uh, my focus is CLL and lymphoma, so I work with pretty much most of the companies that make the CLL drugs or lymphoma drugs, uh, either uh, involving in their research studies that led to the approvals or, uh, or uh, working as an advisor or consultant to, again, most of the, most of the drugs that you will see in these presentations, I have had some involvement with the manufacturer. <clears throat> So I think we have 10 topics to cover in CLL, uh, starting from the initial diagnosis, and I'll try to go very fast um, with, with the first two numbers maybe, and then really focus on the therapeutics. And we'll talk about some kind of the therapeutic agents in general, indications for treatment for CLL, which may or may not change in near future. And then, um, then we talk about the role for early intervention. We, we talk about first line treatment, subsequent lines of therapy and uh, kind of focus on 17P or P53 deleted CLL. We talked briefly about cellular therapies, including just one slide on CAR-T and some, maybe some discussion on allogeneic transplant and also some practical points about the new drugs. So we don't need to talk about the, the diagnosis with this audience. Flow cytometry is a standard of care. Most of our patients are diagnosed Incidentally, they either had a blood work for another reason or, or uh, rarely they, they present with symptoms, but uh, 
uh, as I show in the as I will show in the next slide, that's that's most of the time adequate. We don't really do more more tests other than just a flow cytometry. Uh, of course, we we have to define their disease. When you find the CLL immunophenotype, um, we need to decide if it's a CLL or MBL, depending on the total count of abnormal B cell clone. And if you find the CLL phenotype on a biopsy, you may be dealing with SLL or a small lymphocytic lymphoma. But the, for, for purpose of therapeutic discussion, CLL and SLL are identical diseases. So for our fellows or trainees, uh, we need to be familiar with the immunophenotype of CLL. Uh, these cells are CD5 positive, CD10 negative, as you know. Um, and uh, the differential remains to be mantle cell lymphoma. So whenever you have CD5 positive, CD10 negative, you think about mantle cell lymphoma. And 1114 translocation would be the gold standard for differentiation, although CD23, FMC7 are sometimes helpful, and of course, cyclin D1. Uh, but moving quickly from uh, CLL to just a few words on MBL or monoclonal B lymphocytosis. So we have the CLL uh, immunophenotype, but the number is important. If you have less than 500, if, if you have less than 5,000 abnormal B cell clone, we can't call it CLL. We look at the lymph nodes. If you have large lymph nodes, then, then you have SLL. But if lymph nodes are not enlarged, and if your number is less than 5,000, then you don't have CLL or SLL. So that would be an MBL diagnosis. MBL itself is divided to low count or high count, with a 500 being the cutoff. With low count MBL, progression to CLL is very rare. With high count, you have 1% to 2% per year progression rate to CLL. Uh, most patients with CLL started off with MBL, but MBL patients don't necessarily progress to CLL. It's a familial thing. So when you have somebody with CLL, the um, first degree relatives of that patient are more likely to have CLL, but it doesn't mean that we need to do screening tests or do anything special about the family members. The absolute incidence rate is still low enough to, to uh, not to recommend that. So again, for our trainees and for fellows here, there is a lot of focus on making sure that we're not doing too much for CLL patients. So when you make a diagnosis for a new CLL patient and you get a flow cytometry and patient is asymptomatic, you stop there. There's no need for a scan. There's no need for CT scan. We sometimes get patients coming with even a PET scan. You don't even need to do a bone marrow biopsy if somebody's asymptomatic and they don't have cytopenias, for example. All they do, they just have a typical flow and you, you got what you have. You have the diagnosis and you talk to them about the CLL diagnosis. You talk to them about the fact that they always need a hematologist or oncologist, but as we will show in the future slides, the treatment indications are, that's a different topic. So one of the things that it's, uh, is, uh, there's a lot of focus here is to make sure that we are not over treating or we are not over um, spending on CLL patients for no reason. And that's one of the things that American Society of Hematology is picked as one of the not to do things, to do scans or bone marrow in patients who are not symptomatic with a new diagnosis. So right classification for CLL, it's old, but it's still uh, pretty useful. We use it still in clinical trials. When you read the clinical trials, they, they report right. They sometimes stratify patients based on the right score. And it's a pure clinical scoring system. So remember, when they talk about lymphadenopathy or splenomegaly or hepatomegaly, these are not based on the CT scan. These are just based on physical exam. So um, something to, to remember, again, we don't really use RISE scoring um, or staging in the clinical practice, but it shows up. Uh, boards usually like kind of uh, historic uh, classifications or, or uh, scoring systems. And of course, for SLL, for practical reasons, we use the Ann Arbor staging like lymphomas, although some of the clinical trials recently started using RIE staging for even SLL, but that's a different topic. But what's important these days is molecular profile of CLL. And the list is getting longer and there are many studies looking at different mutations, different uh, cytogenetic informations, looking at different therapeutic agents and relationship between the cytogenetic and that there's a lot of science going on. I know that even at Tehran University, there are research studies going on with, with the molecular testing and cytogenetic. But in the pra practice, really, what matters are two things. Do we have 17p deletion or mutation of the p53 gene? That's the first question. 
And then the second question is looking at the IGHV mutational status, especially if you're using chemoimmunotherapy. So what I try to do when I look, uh, show, show the slides about the study from the clinical trials, we, we try to focus on the mutated and unmutated IGHV because based on that information, for some patients, chemotherapy is still a very reasonable option, especially when you have limited resources and cost is prohibitive, it's important to know that in what patient or which patient population, you can actually safely use chemotherapy and feel comfortable that you're not really offering a treatment that's not uh, the standard. So every patient before treatment needs to have that uh, fish information and the karyotype, uh, complex karyotype defined by three abnormalities. More recently, studies showing that maybe more than five is more important, but three still would be uh, standard. We always check for P53 mutation. The value of P53 mutation is uh, similar to DEL17P for treatment decisions. And as I said, meet, uh, IGHV mutational status is important, especially if you're using chemotherapy, that would be very critical. There's this CLEPI or CLLIPI scoring system that you may see in the literature. And some of the studies are recently using it as a classification factor. So the box in the top shows you what variables go to the, uh, to the scoring system. So P53 mutation or deletion gets four points. Then you have beta-2 microglobulin and the mutation status of IGHV and rise staging and age. And as you see, each variable gets points ranging from four to one. And then you add up those points. And in the box below, you see that what's the total point and what does it translate to in terms of the risk group from low to very high. And in the Kaplan-Meier curve on the right side, you see that this model can actually predict the overall survival nicely. So patients with very high risk and with the orange line have a much lower or um, shorter overall survival compared to, to the green curve, the patients who didn't have a high score had a very low score. Remember that this model was developed in the time of chemoimmunotherapy. So this is uh, uh, relevant to chemoimmunotherapy. We have tried with man, many other groups to uh, see if this model still holds when you use drugs like ibrutinib or venetoclax. Uh, that the problem is uh, those studies were retrospective and a small percentage of patients had all the information from this model. So we couldn't really conclude that it's, it's still um, uh, reliable in, in the current era, but nevertheless is one of the best models that we use. And as I will show you in one of the more very, one of the very important clinical trials that it's ongoing right now, we are using the CLIPI score for, for even inclusion in the criteria. Uh, so this is something that may you, you will see more and more in the literature uh, when you when you read about CLL drugs. So what are the important drugs for CLL? A lot of things have have been happening since 2014, really. If you look, sorry, if you look at the 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 more recent years uh, from 2013 when we had obinutuzumab, a CD20 antibody, and then really 2014, I brought in it by of atumumab, and then later venetoclax, duvilacib in 2018, and most recent, re most recently approved drug is acalabrutinib or acalabrutinib, uh, however you pronounce it. And these drugs are now available, to, and, and chemotherapy is kind of is being shifted to, to the corner. Um, so really the discussion is which patients will benefit from which novel drug. And uh, if we have to pick one or two drugs from all these new drugs, which, which one would be the preferred one? Again, considering the, the, the resource availability and things like that. So if you put these new drugs or, or all treatment agents for CLL in four categories, you have the uh, good old chemotherapy box. We are, we're all familiar with those drugs. We don't need to talk about them. Then you have the anti-CD20 antibodies starting from rituximab. So for CLL, we have in US, we have three FDA approved antibodies for CD20 and soon there may be a fourth one. Um, Ofatumumab is pretty much out for um, the, the company decision. And I think um, we, we don't use it very much uh, anyway. So it's either rituximab or obinutuzumab and oblituximab is, a, is an experimental drug at this point, not approved. The BCR inhibitors or BCR receptor inhibitors are mainly in two groups right now, either BTK inhibitors, virgin tyrosine kinase inhibitors or PI3 kinase inhibitors. Ibrutinib is of course the first in class. So it's, it's, we call it the first generation BTK inhibitor. Then you have two second generation BTK inhibitors, uh, 
One is a calabrutinib, which is approved for CLL in all lines of therapy, and I'll show you the data. Xanabrutinib is another drug, which is second generation. It's currently only approved for mantle cell lymphoma. The approval for CLL is expected in the next few months, and I will show you some very important data that, again, was presented yesterday as the best uh, pre uh, presentation at the uh, presidential section of the EHA meeting a randomized trial, xanabrutinib versus ibrutinib. And then we have two approved PI3 kinase inhibitors, idelalisib in combination with rituximab and duvelisib. And a third one, umbralisib, is also expected to be approved. So maybe it's maybe in the next 12 months or so for CLL. So we'll see. Currently, umbralisib is only approved for marginals and lymphoma and follicular lymphoma. And of course, we have venetoclax, a BCL2 inhibitor. This slide only show, just shows you the four uh, CD20 antibodies. I really don't want to spend time on it. I mean, I, we can look at the slide later, the differences in terms of uh, whether or not they're antibody dependent cytotoxicity or the type of antibody in a structure, really less important these days. So uh, just, just know that we have three and soon four uh, antibodies for CLL. The two, two important classes in the left, you have the B cell receptor inhibitors, including basically what, what happens in CLL, the CLL cells are dependent to the ongoing activity of B cell receptors. So that's what helps the CLL cell to survive. So the idea is to block the downstream enzymes that kind of uh, keep that receptor going. And so you go for one of the enzymes downstream, you, you, you can target BTK, or, uh, and you have three drugs listed there, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, xanabrutinib, and many more that are in development. Or you can target PI3 kinase enzyme, and then you have, I have I've listed four drugs. Copanlisib is actually approved for follicular lymphoma, not for CLL, but in general, these are drugs that can, can uh, basically slow down the B cell receptor activity. So these are important drugs, not only for CLL, but many other diseases, as you know. On the right side, you have the apoptosis pathway. So basically what happens, you have the backs and back that get activated and they activate caspases and release of cytochrome, cytochrome C and that leads to apoptosis. So in normal situation, backs and back are uh, controlled by BCL2 or MCL1. They basically, basically have inhibitory effects on backs and back. So what happens when there is a need for a cell to die, for example, when there is a, a stress, intracellular stress, and it, like a P53's job is to sense that stress, for example. So what happens, it re, uh, the, the group of molecules that are called BH3 only proteins, they can release or relieve that controlling uh, effect of BCL2. So the net product is that the cell goes to apoptosis and death. So what venetoclax does, it actually inhibits BCL2, so induces apoptosis in the cell. What's important to know is that, as you see here, Venetoclax does it independent to P53, meaning that when you have a mutated or deleted P53, so the cell loses its ability to sense the intracellular stress from chemotherapy, for example, Venetoclax can do it without needing P53. So that's very important for two reasons. Number one, P53 mutated or deleted uh, cells are known to have a poor response to typical or conventional treatments in CLL. And also BCL2 is highly expressed in CLL, meaning that those cells are remaining uh, alive. And so it's important to, to uh, relieve that pressure from it. So venetoclax is an important drug and we'll, so, we'll show data uh, regarding the studies that led to the approval of venetoclax and other drugs. So who needs to be treated? We can, we can cover this quickly. Uh, of course, progressive marrow failure, lymphadenopathy, uh, organomegaly symptoms, uh, refractory autoimmune problems, refractory multiple infections that are not um, that are more than uh, usual. But what I put a line on lymphocyte doubling time, that's no longer an indication for treatment. So don't just treat a CLO patient because their lymphocyte count is going up. That's a very common uh, I should say mistake that many we see here a lot that somebody's lymphocyte count is going up to from 20 to 30 or 40 and they say, okay, you need treatment, they start them on treatment. That's not, that's not the right practice. If, if other cells are normal, if there's no neutropenia, if there's no anemia or thrombocytopenia, if there's no lymphadenopathy, the lymphocyte count itself could go up to 400,000. I have many patients in three, 400,000 range of lymphocytes and I'm not treating them. So lymphocyte count only should not be the reason for treatment. 
doubling time or even the absolute number. <clears throat> and that's not in the NCCN guidelines anymore if you look at it. So what about treating patients early at the time of diagnosis? We all know that we, we monitor CLL patients until they meet the indication for treatment. And the reason for that is that we, we use different chemotherapies in the past in randomized trials, and um, we did not see a benefit from starting early. So we used corambucil old days, the fludarabine, fludarabine rituximab. So we, we decided that, okay, early intervention doesn't work. How about the new drugs? Ibrutinib, benitocrax, if you start them early, can you help a patient live longer? And that question was uh, asked, and the study was done by the German CLL study group, CLL-12 study. They defined high-risk CLL patients, which was not a very um, a conventional way of defining high-risk CLL patients, but, but regardless, the, they defined high-risk and they randomized them to either receiving ibrutinib or placebo. Long story short, there was no... So let me just pause for a second. So for, for a study with early intervention, the only endpoint that matters is overall survival. So if you're starting someone on treatment for let's say one, two, three years, who would otherwise not meet the indication for, for, for treatment, right? So you're basically giving three years of treatment or four or five or longer. So you better have a meaningful improvement in their, in their life expectancy. So the, the only important and valuable endpoint for such studies has to be overall survival. So this study did not have the overall survival as the primary endpoint. It was event-free survival, which it, you, know, you see the curves are very different, but you should look at the, the y-axis. It's not overall survival, it's event-free survival. Fortunately, they designed the study in a way that the study is powered in to detect the overall survival benefit with longer follow-up. So we will see, but at the moment, based on this study, we do not start patients on ibrutinib at the time of diagnosis because this study did not show that they live longer. So we should wait for the longer follow-up. What about venetoclax? So that study is currently ongoing. Just, we just opened it uh, nationally uh, in uh, late 2020 and uh, different centers are kind of coming on board. And so we use that CLL IPI score that I showed you. And if patients are very high risk or high risk, or if they have complex karyotype, then they get randomized to start venetoclax and obinutuzumab right at the time of diagnosis, or they wait until they meet the indication for treatment. So this study has a primary endpoint of overall survival, which is, which is as I said, is the right endpoint. But it also means that it takes a while before we get the results of this study. But it could potentially change the practice if it's positive. And maybe for high-risk patients, we, we decide to start patients at the time of diagnosis. But I think this is an important study that we should watch for, but it will take years for us to get the results. Okay, how do we treat patients who are first line and they don't have 17p deletion or p53 mutation. So the first question we need to ask, as I said, what's the status of p53? And let's say they don't have it. This is a typical patient, you're 68 year old with 13q deletion, they have large lymph nodes and you need to start them on treatment. This is the summary slide. So I show it first, then I show you a few slides that kind of covers the studies that led to this conclusion that I made. And then I'll show this slide again, again at the end. But this is the summary. If I have a patient today who needs treatment, the choices that I have are basically three choices. I either start them on venetoclax, and G is, by the way, Gaziva or obinutuzumab. I put G just to make it shorter, but uh, obinutuzumab is the CD20 antibody. So I either, I either start them on venetoclax and obinutuzumab, and that's one-year treatment. So patients get treated for one year, and then I stop or they can go on a calabrutinib, a second generation BTK inhibitor. I have plus minus G, but really, I mean, I, no, I don't think anybody uses uh, antibody with a calabrutinib, but the label has obinutuzumab with it too. So we, I just kind of mentioned it for the sake of completeness, but it's either a calabrutinib or ibrutinib. Really the choices are between either venetoclax or a drug like ibrutinib, okay? How about FCR? FCR, as I will show you, was inferior to ibrutinib in a clinical trial. But there, there is a specific patient um, um, type of patient who may still benefit from FCR. And 
it could be a reasonable option in young patients who are fit, meaning that they don't have kidney problems or other comorbidities. They have to have a mutated IGHV. They should not have 17 P deletion or P53 mutation. And I would say they should not also have 11 Q deletion because 11 Q patients respond to chemo, but they relapse quickly. So why are we so strict on FCR? Because it can cause MDS and leukemia. And that rate is five to 7% with five-year follow-up. It's not a low, uh, low chance of having a myelodysplastic syndrome or AML. And we all know with a secondary AML and MDS, the outcomes are extremely poor. So these days with all these novel agents, if I give some, somebody FCR, I need to be at least uh, confident that they will have a great benefit from FCR. I show you in a second why FCR could be a good option. So if the patient doesn't meet this criteria, then the response to FCR will not be as great, then it doesn't make sense to accept the risk of MDS and AML and expose them to FCR. How about bendamustine rituximab? That's a very popular regimen even here. It's probably still, even with all the, all the new drugs, doctors like to use it and patients are okay with it. It's not preferred. Again, it lost to ibrutinib in a head-to-head -head randomized clinical trial. But again, in a mutated patient, if there, and, and you know, under, we understand that some patients don't have access to these new drugs. So especially in mutated IGHV patients, and of course, uh, I would not give chemotherapy to anyone with 17 P deletion or P53 mutation, but if you have to use chemotherapy, I actually favor bendamustine rituximab over FCR. Yes, it may give you a shorter remission, but at least it doesn't give you the risk of MDS and AML. The risk is 0.9% with BR versus 5 to 7% with FCR. And uh, so let's just talk about why FCR is so popular, right? So the, the left curve is from the CLL10 study and this, is, was, this was the study that compared FCR to bendamustine rituximab. It doesn't matter. That's not why, why I put this slide here. But please pay attention to the green curve, which has this red uh, kind of circle around it. See, there is a plateau. These are patients who had mutated IGHV and received FCR. See that at five years, their progression-free survival is around 80%. That's very impressive. It means that if you give a young, if, if you give somebody FCR and they have mutated IGHV, five years later, 80% of them don't have progression. That's a very impressive uh, result. On the right side, you see the same data from MD Anderson group and very small study, well, 300 study, uh, patients total, but the pa when we get to the, towards the end of the curve, the numbers may not be very high. And, but pay attention again to the plateau and the curve and look, look at the uh, x-axis. Here you have up to 15 years of follow-up. So in patients who had a mutated IGHV, around 70% who are still in remission. So that's why FCR is, is a good treatment, but for selected patients. See, when you look at the unmutated patients, their curves drop very quickly. So these are not the type of patients who will really benefit from FCR, but you do still give them the risk of MDS and AML. That's why IGHV mutation status is important. Now, a few years ago, our standard of care for first line was chemotherapy. We would, we would look at the patient's fitness ranging from that young guy uh, in the top. We would give that person FCR, for example. Older patients would get bendamustine rituximab. More uh, like older and more frail patients would get maybe corambicil and CD20 antibody. So there were a number of clinical trials in the past few years that went head to head for each chemotherapy. So for example, ibrutinib versus FCR, ibrutinib versus bendamustine rituximab, ibrutinib versus corambucil, acalabrutinib versus corambucil obinutuzumab, venetoclax and obinutuzumab versus corambucil obinutuzumab. And you notice that a lot of new drugs went for corambucil obinutuzumab because it's just a weaker chemotherapy, it's easier to beat. So I have the question mark because we don't know the answer. We didn't know the answer, but uh, well, now we do. I, I'll show you this, the studies. And in parentheses are the name of the clinical trials. So let's start from the FCR versus, bendam I'm sorry, ibrutinib and rituximab. So in this study, patients did not have 17P deletion. They got randomized to receive either FCR or ibrutinib and rituximab. Guess what? Ibrutinib is the red curve and was superior to FCR from both progression-free survival and overall survival. So if you look at the whole study, 
patients who received ibrutinib lived longer. That's very impressive, right? So this study was was a big news uh, at the time and still got to the New England Journal of Medicine, was a ash plenary, uh, late breaking, I believe in 2019. And okay, what is the first question that you want to ask? What, what about the mutation status? I just showed you that FCR does really good in mutated IGHV. Did ibrutinib beat FCR in the mutated population or not? I think that's an important question, right? Let's look at that. And the left side, when you look at the mutated IGHV, FCR and ibrutinib are not very different actually. The biggest difference is in the right side when you have unmutated IGHV and there you see a very nice separation with ibr between ibrutinib and FCR. I don't know how I'm doing with time. I should probably talk a little bit faster. So um, FCR is better than ibrutinib, but in mutated patients, as I showed you, still a reasonable option to, to use. Very quickly, next study was bendamustin rituximab versus ibrutinib. So this was a three-arm study. One group only got ibrutinib. The other group got ibrutinib and rituximab. The third group only got bendamustin and rituximab. So two lessons from this study. Number one, if you look at the blue and orange curves, they're over overlying. They're like identical. So this means that rituximab didn't really add anything to ibrutinib. Okay, so ibrutinib should not be given with rituximab period. That's lesson number one from this study. Lesson number two, they're both better than bendamustin rituximab, but they're better from the progression-free standpoint. If you look at the right side, the overall survival is pretty similar. So that's why I say that if you don't have access to ibrutinib, you know from this study that your patients will relapse earlier if you give them chemotherapy, but you know, maybe when they relapse, hopefully you can give them novel agents again and then overall survival will be the same. Again, I would just make it very clear. I would not use bendamustin or toximab as my preferred choice, but in real life, we have patients who don't have or can't afford the new drug. So I think, I think chemotherapy is reasonable, especially if they have mutated IGHV. And same thing, that the, the, there was no, not much difference in the mutated uh, patients in the right side. Okay, now we, we, we get to uh, an, another topic. So these five drugs are five BTK inhibitors. Ibrutinib is the first one, and then acalabrutinib, the xanabrutinib, and the, the last two ones are kind of not approved and in, in development still. This is a kind of map. This shows you that what enzymes each drug blocks. So if you look at ibrutinib, you, the, the BTK is blocked, the red circles, and the bigger it is, it means that it, it, it kind of goes around the enzyme and maybe has some off-target effects. It may also, in addition to blocking BTK, for example, we know that ibrutinib blocks ITK or TEC or EGFR. That's why you get the rash with ibrutinib. But look at the calabrutinib. It's much cleaner. It only goes for uh, BTK and maybe just a little bit of activity in the other, on the other enzymes. Xanobrutinib is another second generation, is also much cleaner. Luxo305 is a drug that made, made big news if, like less than a month ago with the Lancet paper, and I'll have one slide about it. It's, it's probably one of the most important drugs for CLL that you'll hear a lot about in the next few years. So it's also very clean, but it has other um, uh, characteristics other than being clean. But what I'm showing you here is that after ibrutinib came and, and we know it works, there are new drugs that are trying to make ibrutinib better because ibrutinib is great, but it has side effects. A lot of patients have to stop ibrutinib because of side effects. And when you use cleaner version of ibrutinib, like acalabrutinib or xanabrutinib, those side effects are hopefully less. And I'll show you studies that have shown that. Now, acalabrutinib was studied in this three-arm randomized trial with a control arm being corambicilobinutuzumab. This is from a presentation actually a, a week ago uh, or a, yesterday, EHA. So this shows the four-year follow-up of that study. As you see, the acalabrutinib with obinutuzumab on the top and acalabrutinib by itself are much better than chemotherapy. So this drug got approval for the first line CLL based on this study. Probably the, one of the most important studies for the first line treatment of CLL is this study, it's German CLL 14 study. It was a randomized study between, patients got randomized to two treatments. They either received venetoclax for one year. With the first month, they also got obinutuzumab. I'm, the, I'm sorry, with the first six months, they also got obinutuzumab. So six months of obinutuzumab, one year of uh, venetoclax, and then they stopped. 
The control group received obinutuzumab and corambucil, again, corambucil for one year, obinutuzumab for six months. This is different than most of the other studies where they only gave corambucil for six months. So remember that the control arm here was actually much stronger than the other ones. Now, this is the longest follow-up, again, presented yesterday at EHA, for 52 months follow-up, venetoclax, obinutuzumab, the blue curve, it's of course much better. Nobody's surprised, but remember, this is only one year of treatment. This is not a continuous treatment like ibrutinib or acalabrutinib, one year. And after one year, you see that the responses are still durable with the median not, not reached with venetoclax, obinutuzumab. And at four years, 74% of patients were still progression free. Remember, when I say four years, it means that the three years was, was off treatment. They only got one treat, one year of treatment, three years, no treatment, still 74% off treatment. This is important. If patients have to pay a lot of money for a new drug, do you give them a drug that they have to take forever? Or do you give them a drug that they can take for one year and then stop if it gives you such a great remission? Again, Mutation status seems to actually matter with venetoclax. The mutated and unmutated are kind of separating, but we still don't use it as a decision uh, factor for venetoclax. And this is time to next treatment. In patients who got venetoclax and obinutuzumab, at five years, 80% of them didn't need another treatment. As you know, progression and needing treatment are two different things for CLL, right? You can still progress and don't have indication for treatment. So basically after four years of follow-up, 80% of patients who only got one year of treatment did not require another line of therapy. Again, that's important, I think, for even resource management. So the, the, the combination of obinutuzumab and venetoclax gives you high MRD negativity at the end of one year, 57% in, in the bone marrow and 76% uh, in, the, in the blood. And the long-term remissions correlate very nicely with the MRD negativity. So if they had undetectable MRD, they, they were more likely to stay in remission. So that would be a very important endpoint. Although, as I said, every, for my practice, I don't look, I do look at MRD at the end of one year, but I don't continue them on treatment if they're MRD positive. I still stop because I go with the label, but there's there are many studies that are going on right now to use MRD as a guidance to stop treatment. But right now the standard is to go one year and stop. If they still have the detectable MRD, you just know that they may relapse earlier compared to somebody who has no MRD detectable. So this is the same slide. I'm just showing you that Every single study that compared one of the new drugs to conventional chemotherapy showed that the new drugs were better. And I just showed you the data. So same summary slide that I showed you at the beginning. So if I have somebody first line, I either go with venetoclax or venetuzumab. That's my preferred regimen because I showed you, I can only give them one year and it stopped. And that, that's a big deal. Patients care about that. And I think it's nice to have somebody not needing treatment for three, year, three years. It's a cancer drug. It can cause side effects. It mentally it's important for patients not to be taking a cancer medication. And financially, of course, of course, here, for example, insurance companies pay for the drug. It probably doesn't matter much, but if patient is paying out of pocket, the, the difference between the blue box and the orange boxes or yellow boxes is that for the other two drugs, the, the, the treatment continues. But let's say financial issues are not a problem patient has an insurance that pays both. How do you decide between BTK inhibitors or venetoclax-based therapy? There's no head-to-head -head trials that we, we have at the moment. There is an ongoing study by the German group comparing these things. So we'll have an answer at some point. But right now we just go with the discussion that we have with the patients. We tell them, hey, if you take BTK inhibitor, you have to take it forever. Uh, but if you get venetoclax, it's, it's a fixed duration for one year. Uh, I tell them, the, the drug like acalabrutinib or ibrutinib is very easy to start. You just start taking it. And I see you in two, two weeks first, and then once a month, and then every three months. It's a very easy treatment for physician and for the patient. I'm talking about ibrutinib, acalabrutinib. Venetoclax, you have to do the ramp up. It takes five weeks for us to get the patient to the right dose. And I will show you, we'll talk about it in a second. So it's a lot of work at the beginning because of the tumor lysis risk with venetoclax. But once they pass that initial phase, it's a very well-tolerated drug as well. 
We also talk about the side effects, of course. And again, we have slides in uh, slides coming. So PTK inhibitors, we know they, they can cause atrial fibrillation, bleeding problems, muscle cramps, joint pain, muscle pain. You don't have any of those with venetoclax. And so basically we have these discussions with the patients and you know, some decide, most decide to go with the fixed duration with venetoclax, some decide to go with BTK inhibitors. They're both right answers. They're both category one recommendations on NCCN guidelines. They're both board answer. If, if nobody will ask anybody on board which one is better, it may be better. One option may be better for a specific patient. If somebody is on warfarin, for example, you, you're worried about bleeding risk, you go with venetoclax. If somebody is in renal failure and they don't have a family member who can bring them to the clinic once a week, then you go with the BTK inhibitor. So you kind of make a decision based on clinical situation. How about in patients who had prior line of therapy and now they need treatment, relapse patients. This is the summary. Basically the same thing. You have the same options, but then you have the green boxes here. And these, these are duvelisib and idelolisib, which you did not see in the first line, but you do see them in the relapse. And I'll tell you in a second, why is that? So basically for patients who had prior lines of therapy, we look at what they had. If they had um, so as I said, the options are venetoclax or BTK inhibitors. And of course, it depends on what they had for the first line, right? If they had chemotherapy for the first line, then you can go with either one. You know, I'll show you again that venetoclax and rituximab is again only two years to treatment versus the other agents that are ongoing or indefinite treatment duration. But if patient, for example, had venetoclax for first line, you go with, with the BTK inhibitor. If they had BTK inhibitor in the first line, you go with venetoclax. PI3 kinase inhibitors are not first or second options. They're usually used in the third line, mainly because of the side effect problems. Okay, so let's let's look at some, uh, oh, just, just one more point. So every time we start somebody on a new line of therapy, we need to repeat fish. We, look, we need to look for 17P or P53 abnormality because this can change over time. IGH3 mutational status doesn't change. You just check it once and it's good. For other cytogenetic changes, we do we do repeat. If somebody had chemotherapy in the past, we, we always check for MDS. We always do a bone marrow, especially they present with cytopenias. And I have to tell you, these days it, there is a very very limited role for chemotherapy in the relapse setting. It's uh, I, I don't remember using it in the past five years really. So all novel agents in the relapse setting. These are old studies. I really don't want to spend any time. Ibrutinib was better than single agent CD20 antibody. That led to the Ibrutinib approval. Then another next study, ACAL Ibrutinib, they compared it to in the control arm, physicians could either pick bendamustine, rituximab, or idelolisib. But really, the, the drug of interest or the experimental drug here was ACAL Ibrutinib. And ACAL Ibrutinib was better than BR and it was better than idelolisib and uh, it led to the approval of acalabrutinib for relapse. Idelolisib, this is very old, 2014. Idelolisib and rituximab was better than placebo and rituximab. This led to the approval of idelolisib. Next drug is duvelisib. It's a PI3 kinase inhibitor. They compared it to ofatumumab, a CD20 antibody. It was, it was better from the PFS standpoint. It got the approval. It, does it mean that we use it? No, but it's approved. But this is again another important study with venetoclax rituximab versus bendamustine rituximab. So patients who got randomized to venetoclax, they got venetoclax for two years. And for the first six months, they also got rituximab. So ven R, the control arm was bendamustine rituximab uh, with 70 milligram per meter squared dose for bendamustine for two days, just a standard regimen. So this was the Murano study. Of course, ven R was superior as you see the median, the, the green versus uh, blue uh, curve. So venetoclax rituximab was superior to bendamustine rituximab with a fixed duration two years. Green curves or green curve are patients who had undetectable MRD at the end of treatment. The yellow or orange are those who had intermediate MRD level. The red are those who had high MRD level. And you see that MRD status nicely predicted the progression-free survival. So at the end of two years, if you have undetectable disease, patients are more likely to stay in remission. This was a very important, to me, the most important slide from last ASH for CLL. So let's just focus on the, the, the bottom line there. The, 
the, the green, I'm sorry, the gray box says approximately 24 months, right? So the patient's got two years or 24 months of treatment. The blue box shows you in patients who had no detectable minimal residual disease, no MRD, it took 19 months for them to convert to positive MRD. And from that time, it took still took 25 months from MRD to have disease progression that you can detect on clinical, uh, clinically on a scan or physical exam. So this means that it takes a long time, even if they start having small clones in their blood or in the bone marrow, it takes a long time before they have clinical relapse. Again, I go back to the same principle of being able to give somebody only two years of treatment and they remain in remission for a long time, even if they they relapse by having their MRD uh, kind of uh, appearing, still takes median two years for them to have clinical relapse. So venetoclax rituximab is, is one of the standard options because of that reason. Now, I showed you ibrutinib and I showed you acalabrutinib and I told you acalabrutinib is a cleaner drug and you know uh, the, um, the studies in the past showed that patients who take acalabrutinib, they tolerate it better, and we had a study, this was a study that patients who took ibrutinib and couldn't tolerate it and they stopped it, they went on a calabrutinib and it, this study showed that they tolerated a calabrutinib much better. So a lot of side effects that they had on ibrutinib, they didn't have on a calabrutinib. But this year at ASCO, just last week, we had the results of a head-to-head -head randomized trial comparing a calabrutinib to ibrutinib. <clears throat> so Again, patients either got acalabrutinib or ibrutinib in the relapse setting, and they only included patients with 17p deletion and 11q uh, deletion. But I put a box below because this is important. For a clinical trial, when you read the studies, you pay attention to the primary endpoint. This was a non-inferiority study. So the study, the primary endpoint was showed that, to, that the, their main aim was to show that acalabrutinib is not worse than ibrutinib. They wanted to say, okay, we are as good as ibrutinib from the efficacy standpoint, but our side effects profile is better. So the study had a, had a primary endpoint of pro progression-free survival, non-inferiority. Okay, they reached that. That's the, I'll show you the curve in a second. The two drugs are much very similar in terms of progression-free survival. So this is the curve, okay? Acalabrutinib is not worse than ibrutinib. That's okay. But they also showed that their side effect profile is much better than ibrutinib in the head-to-head -head randomized trial. So yellow is ibrutinib, blue is acalabrutinib. First box is AFib or atrial fibrillation, a flutter. It's lower with this new drug, acala. Hypertension is a big problem with ibrutinib. We are very concerned about cardiovascular events in patients on ibrutinib for a long time. Acala is a much better drug from the hypertension standpoint and bleeding, diarrhea, arthralgia, every, so basically this study showed that, okay, from the efficacy standpoint, it's not worse, it's the same, but side effect profile is better. So I think because of that, um, you know, a calabrutinib uh, is, is, is a better, uh, in my opinion, BTK inhibitor. And if I use a BTK inhibitor, I use a calabrutinib and, uh, instead of ibrutinib. This is just a summary. In the interest of time, I'll try to finish in five minutes so we have enough time for questions and answers. Uh, for patients with 17p deletion P53, here's a little bit different. The first choice, in my opinion, has to be BTK inhibitors because the data is better with BTK inhibitors for these patients compared to venetoclax. And I'll show you in a second why. But the second line would be venetoclax-based therapy. And the third line is PI3 kinase, although there's not much data for these high-risk patients uh, at the third line with, with PI3 kinase inhibitors. But those are the only drugs we have at the moment. So old days when you only had chemotherapy, the median progression-free survival from best chemotherapy was at best 11 months. So if you gave FCR to somebody with 17P, less than a year later, their disease would be back. And we all know that their outcomes are poor. So this is before the new drugs. Now with the new drugs, this is what we get from ibrutinib. The first curve on the left side is the eight-year follow-up of the NIH group with ibrutinib in 17p deleted patients. And you look at the red curve, the progression-free survival is around 61% at six years. That's very impressive. Compare that to FCR, which was less than a year. So ibrutinib works for 17p deletion and different studies. Again, same, same thing in different settings. 
Venetoclax for 17P, still much better than chemotherapy in the CLL14 study based on the update that we had again yesterday, the median PFS 49 months, 49 months median PFS in patients who had 17P deletion and got venetoclax and obinutuzumab. Acalabrutinib again from the study at EHA this year, the long four-year PFS is 75% with acalabrutinib in the first line. I'm just showing you that these new drugs work great for 17P. They're, they don't work as good as they work for patients without 17P, but definitely much better than chemotherapy. Now, I told you I, I, I prefer ibrutinib over venetoclax for 17P in the first line, and this is why. I showed you that this is the same care from the NIH study. At six years, these are 17P deleted patients. At six years, 61% had progression-free survival with ibrutinib. With venetoclax obinutuzumab, their median PFS was 49 months. It means that um, if you look at the X access, the follow-up is much shorter, but the care for ibrutinib, you're not supposed to compare cross trials, but um, basically it's very clear that ibrutinib treated patients did much better. Remember one point, ibrutinib patients continued ibrutinib for eight years. Venetoclax patients only took venetoclax for one year. So a lot of my colleagues believe that if you continue venetoclax also for seven years, you get the same nice care that you get from ibrutinib, and that may be true. We just don't have that data. So I, I think that BTK inhibitors, the evidence-based approach is still to go with a BTK inhibitor for frontline 17P. But it may be true that if you continued venetoclax, they would get the same nice care, although you have to show it in a study, you can't just guess. And this is my summary that I showed you at the beginning for 17P patients. The preference would be BTK inhibitor then second line and third line. How about cellular therapies? I don't wanna talk about CAR-T, although I would love to, but it's not approved for CLL. There's no access to it anyways in clinical trials, unfortunately in Iran. But this is something that's being studied. It sounds like the long-term remissions are in the range of 40%. And MRD after CAR T is a very strong predictor of response. So we'll see. We use it uh, before car, before allogeneic transplant, definitely. How about allogeneic transplant? And uh, we I recently re reviewed the literature for CAR, both CAR T and transplant, and I'm happy to share the paper because there there are a lot of details about allotransplant for CLL. That if if somebody's interested, I think it covers all the studies so far. But there are a few principles about allotransplant for CLL, and I think it has a very important um, role for treating high-risk CLL patients in, in places where there's limited access to these new drugs. Number one, the conditioning regimen for allotransplant for CLL has to be reduced intensity or non-myeloablative. The, the myeloablative conditioning for CLL has been shown in different studies, many studies that in, increases the mortality. Remember, the median age of diagnosis for CLL is 68. It means that your patients most of the time are not even eligible for myeloablative allotransplant. So if you look at this, I only included some of the recent studies on this table and from different groups that show that, that, show that you, can, you can use allotransplant even after ibrutinib or venetoclax, even after patients failed ibrutinib, for example, and they're in remission, you can do a transplant. And outcomes are actually pretty good. The, the Kim study and Roker study, as you see there, they're reporting overall survivals in the range of 70, 80%, PFS in the range of uh, uh, 40%, uh, I'm sorry, 50, 60%, with a non relapse mortality of less than 20%. So, so again, reduced intensity. If you look at the papers, they've used, these are multi center studies. Each center used a different conditioning. You have BU flu, you have uh, flu psi, you have, we use a lot of, in Seattle, we use non myelablative, we use flu and low-dose TBI, which is the least uh, intensive conditioning. And still, our, our outcomes are very, very good with allo. But, um, um, you know, you, Hopkins has shown nicely that haplo is feasible and it's very effective. And you see nice numbers, same, same kind of overall in PFS numbers with haploid transplant. There's data for CORD, although these days with the randomized study, there's less and less uh, interest in the CORD transplant. So the point here is that Allogeneic transplant is very valuable tool for treating high-risk patients, especially, I'll show you the algorithm that we use here, but 
when you add cost to it and keeping somebody on ibrutinib for seven years really versus doing an allotransplant, I think I would uh, really uh, highlight the importance of using reduced intensity or non-myeloblative. And again, the conditionings and every all the studies are listed in that review paper. Um, so when we talk to patients, we talk about in general, if you look at all across the studies, that overall survival is 50 of 50%. PFS of 40% and uh, non-relapse mortality, mortality in the range of 20-25%. So what we use here is, um, I'll try to go through this very quickly. When we start some a patient on a novel agent, as soon as they fail them or the novel agent fails them, like let's say they're on ibrutinib and they don't tolerate it, we switch to a calabrutinib or, or, or another BTK inhibitor. If they don't tolerate a even a second generation BTKI or if their disease progresses and we switch them to venetoclax, right? The time for referral for allogeneic transplant or CAR T is when they're responding to the next drug. What does it mean? So I don't have to, I should not wait until patient has disease progression on venetoclax to start thinking about allogeneic transplant because you need a remission and CLL can be very hard to control if, if you have a double refractory patient, somebody who failed BTK inhibitor and venetoclax, it's very difficult to get them to cellular therapy. So the timing is when they're on the second drug and they're still responding. So if they started with venetoclax and they're now on ibrutinib and they're responding, send them for allo. If they started with ibrutinib now and they're venetoclax and they're responding, send them for allo. Don't wait until they also fail venetoclax because you pretty much have nothing else to control their disease with. Yes, you can give high dose steroids or random chemotherapy, but we all know they don't work. They increase the mortality risk and rate of infection. And here I have CAR-T, which I don't want to spend time because it's not relevant to the audience at this point. A few principles and I'm, I'm going to stop. So BTK inhibitors, there are common side effects with ibrutinib and acalabrutinib. They're much less common with acalabrutinib. I just showed you the randomized study. So muscle cramps, cytopenias, hypertension, diarrhea. The, me the main side effects, of course, bleeding. We hold the drug. We try to avoid warfarin. Atrial fibrillation is, is a real problem with uh, ibrutinib, less of a problem with acalabrutinib. PI3 kinase inhibitors cause all kinds of uh, immune-induced uh, side effects like transaminitis, pneumonitis. Uh, colitis, they increase risk of PJP pneumonia, they increase risk of CMV reactivation. So we usually put them on a, a prophylactic treatment for, for um, PJP, um, uh, PJP prophylaxis and also monitor their CMV. We don't use PI3 kinase inhibitors in the first line because the side effects are much more common when you use them in the first line. So you did not see me talking about idololisib or duvelisib in the first line treatment. Remember, of course, venetoclax it can cause tumor lysis syndrome. So there is, uh, you have to start slow at 20 and then 50 and 100 and 200 and 400 weekly. We follow this religiously. It's very important. Patients can die from tumor lysis. It's what, if you follow the ramp up, I've, we haven't had a case. So some patients need to be in the hospital and some patients can't wait five weeks for dose escalation. So those patients, we admit them to the hospital. We go up on the dose very quickly in a few days. And I'm happy to talk about it in the Q and A. So, and this is just the approach that I uh, explained. I'm not, I don't want to spend time on it. Uh, so if two more slides on what's new in CLL, what is coming? There are new approvals that we're expecting in the next year. One is xanobrutinib, the drug I showed you. The other one is a combination of another PI3 kinase inhibitor, umbralisib and oblituximab. So xanobrutinib is another second generation uh, BTK inhibitor. There are there is very strong data with xanobrutinib. Number you see that 17P study with more than 100 patients. I mean, even ibrutinib doesn't have that many patients uh, for, for 17P. And there was another randomized trial presented at EHA yesterday that compared xanobrutinib to ibrutinib. Here you see that progression-free survival curves are different. Uh, again, statistically they're not different yet, but by this, just looking at the curves are different. This study needs to have a follow-up and they, they you, we can't say that it's a better drug than ibrutinib. That, that the, from the statistical designs, we can't say it, but it just tells you it at least as good as ibrutinib. And again, the side effect profile is much better. So xanobrutinib, the reason I wanted to mention it, it's approved in China for CLL. So if you 
have a patient who has access to it or somehow it's easier to get the drug from China, don't think that that's, a, that's not, not a, it's actually a very good drug, probably the best BTK inhibitor along with acalabrutinib. So a very, very uh, uh, effective and well tolerated BTK inhibitor. Combination of umbralisib ob oblituximab was also presented at ASH and it will probably be approved for CLL in the relapse and fr first line. I'm not sure how much we will use it. It's another PI3 kinase inhibitor. It has a better safety profile, but still we would still go with a BTK inhibitor of venetoclax the first line. This is a drug that you will hear about a lot. It's called pirtubrutinib or Loxo305. It was in the Lancet a month ago. This is a novel BTK inhibitor. You see there, no, it's, it's much cleaner than ibrutinib, but it also binds to BTK independent to the C481S, which is the area that if you have mutation in, patients become resistant to BTK, to ibrutinib or acalabrutinib or xanabrutinib. So if somebody progressed on ibrutinib, you can't give them acalabrutinib or xanabrutinib, but you can give them Loxo305 or pirtobrutinib. The study showed that the drug works nicely in patients who progress on ibrutinib and acalabrutinib, I have many patients in my clinic, one patients who had growing lymph nodes on ibrutinib and you put them on pirtobrutinib and it works in days. It's an amazing drug. It's not approved. It may get approved for post BTKI and post venetoclax. I don't know, but the study, there are many studies I'm going to bring this drug to the, even the first line. So, you know, the, the one drug to watch in the meet, future meetings when you go to the meetings or read the, read the literature is pirtobrutinib. With that, I would stop here and uh, we'll be happy to answer questions. Sorry, I think I went over time a little bit, but um, okay, I don't know if I'm sharing my screen or, or not. Okay, I'm gonna read the questions too, but I think Dr. Ashrafi is going to read them too. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shadman. Uh, we have two questions till now. Uh, the first one is about the the patient with uh, 70 p deletion, and the patient is on ibrutinib. Uh, because we have we don't have access to the second generation drugs like venetoclax, uh, we wanted to know when you decide to uh, for allogenic transplant for this type of the patient. Uh, in other words, what are the response criteria when the patient is on ibrutinib and when? you decided to uh, send the patient for allogenic transplant? Very good question. So as I said here, we, we use the first drug and then we wait until they go on venetoclax and then we send them for allo. But I totally understand that that may not be feasible. So in terms of response criteria, the two studies that looked at allogenic transplant in patients who uh, had prior exposure to drugs like ibrutinib or venetoclax, it didn't matter if they were in complete remission or they were in a very good partial remission before allogenic transplant, meaning that you don't have to necessarily wait for a complete remission to send the patient for allo. So I would say if you start somebody with 17P and their disease is controlled six months later, 12 months later, if their lymph nodes are uh, small and you can start the process, I would not stop ibrutinib. I would just go until last minute and when they get the graft, then you watch them closely. I mean, the nice thing about ibrutinib, it's a good post allogenic drug too. I mean, if they relapse, for example, you can use it or uh, of course for chronic GVHD. But yeah, I mean, as long as their disease is under control and it doesn't have to be a complete remission, MRD status is not important in pre allo transplant for CLL. So don't have to wait until a clean bone marrow. That, that's, not, that's not important. Uh uh, another question is about the addition of the rituximab to ibrutinib. Would you recommend the addition of rituximab to ibrutinib? No, I just showed you the data that the, the two curves of ibrutinib versus ibrutinib and uh, rituximab were overlapping. So there's no, there's no, I've used rituximab in addition to ibrutinib once. Uh, or maybe I should say twice. So I, the two situations is like, if you have somebody with like hemolysis and first of all, we have learned that you can treat patients with ibrutinib and the hemolysis and even ITP usually response, but I think it would be reasonable to give those patients rituximab as well, because you know you wanna control their hemolysis or ITP, and then you put them on ibrutinib too. Uh, 
I had, uh, but the second case that I used it is a very rare situation. So I, did, the, the, I don't need to talk about it, but no, abs no, rituximab, you don't need to give it with, uh, with uh, ibrutinib. And uh, another question is about uh, how you monitor uh, patients with CLL about the secondary malignancies. Would you uh, recommend any uh, typical screening methods for secondary malignancies or not? Now, for the, the one cancer that I send, uh, skin cancers are, uh, is the only one that I have my patients see a dermatologist and establish care and follow with the dermatologist. I tell them to kind of use the skin protection and things like that. But for other cancers, we just use the age uh, appropriate screening tests for other cancers like colonoscopy, mammogram, things like that. Nothing specific. And we have a question about the hereditary pattern of CLL in the family. Uh, is there any specific type of inheritance or not? Just increase the risk in the family. Yeah, no, there's no specific pattern of like, you know, in terms of like being autosomal dominant. No, not, nothing like that. It's just that the incidence is higher in the family and it's not predictable. Uh, again, we don't even recommend any, any uh, it's not one of those predispositions that you send the patient to like a genetic counseling or things like that. They just know that it's more common in the relatives, but there's nothing that they need to do about it. Um, and uh, another question is, is about the checking of TP53 in the CLL patients. Uh, as you know, we, we have access only to the, the fish panel in CLL patients in Iran, and uh, uh, we don't have access to check of the TP53 by sequencing. Uh, is it adequate or we should do both of them? I thought that, I don't know, maybe Dr. Yagmoy, I thought I've seen reports from patients in Iran. I mean, you do check for P53 mutation in some centers maybe, right? Uh, we check P53 mutation by sequencing, but not routinely. Oh. Uh, but as you know, that 80% of patients with deletion of P53 also have P53 mutation. But we miss 20% of patients if we don't have access to sequencing for P53 mutation. Right. So yeah, if, you, if there's no access to it, then you know you 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 miss that 10, 20 percent, depending on what, where which line of treatment they are. Like in, in relapse setting is higher, but you know, again, if you're using novel agents, it probably doesn't matter because you know ibrutinib, venetoclax, they're effective. But uh, yeah, I mean. If there's no access, I don't know what, yeah. But I mean, if you're using chemotherapy, for example, uh, it may make sense to refer a patient to a center that can check the mutation. I wouldn't give chemo to somebody who uh, has the mutation. Uh, and another question is about the use of the ibrutinib. if it lowered the dosage than the standard dose because of the financial toxicity. Is there any evidence for using this type of treatment or not? Very good question. I, there's no, I can't, okay. So in patients who start at 420 and we have to dose reduce because of side effects to 280, they seem to respond as well. So the response to the 280 milligram doesn't seem to be very different than 420. When you get to 140, I think if you look at the initial studies with ibrutinib with the per kg, that's that's probably under treatment. But I would personally feel very comfortable if I have to dose reduce to 280 to keep patients on 280. Do I recommend that starting somebody at the lower dose? I don't think I can say that. There's no studies, but you know we know we know it kind of works. The second thing is, of course, and this may be an area or like a good research question that could be done in Iran that or any, any, any uh, place with like limited resources. We know that in a lot of patients who stop ibrutinib for side effects, they can still go for months or years without needing treatment. So there's data actually from the median time to progression in patients who stop uh, ibrutinib, it was 27 months, it's, it's more than two years. So maybe it could be an interesting idea to look at ibrutinib treat for one year and stop. Nobody has done it for obvious reasons. I mean, the, the drug companies are not interested in uh, 
uh, limiting the duration of treatment or using a lower dose, but this is something that academic centers can do if they can somehow get the drug or, yeah. But the, to answer your question, I think 280, I would personally feel comfortable that 280 is probably as good. It works, works reasonably well. 140, I would be a little bit uncomfortable with. Uh, and uh, another question is about the patient uh, with the uh, 70 p deletion. When we don't uh, have access to the genetoclax, uh, any in this type of patient or, or only palliative? I th you're being cut off, but I think your question was in because if you don't have access to venetoclax after ibrutinib, what, what you would do? Or, or ibrutinib in a 70p deletion. Right, right. Uh, um, and, no, the, the, and no access no, to ibrutinib, transplant? No, venetoclax. No transplant? Uh, we, we have access to transplant. Is there I, any role for chemo immunity? Okay, so if the goal is to get somebody to allotransplant, oh, I'm sorry, are you? I think Dr. Ashraf, I don't know if it's me or maybe. At the first in this. I think her connection is right. Or I don't have her. I think the question was about 17P patients. If there's no access to uh, venetoclax, uh, what to do? Can we use chemotherapy? So that's why I said at the beginning, if we know that we only have, let's say, ibrutinib for a 17P. And I would, I would say as soon as you start ibrutinib and patient is in a reasonable remission, you just send them to allotransplant. You don't wait until they progress on ibrutinib. If they did, and while you're maybe, you know, maybe somebody on ibrutinib progresses and you still have the option for transplant, before we had ibrutinib, uh, you, there is actually published literature on using high dose methylprednisone, one or two grams plus rituximab in 17P actually works. Um, and you know, it, you, you, at least you can keep your patient uh, stable until you get, get them to allo. So high dose methylpred and rituximab is one option. Chemo, I mean, you do, you may, depending on the clone size of the 17P clone, you may actually get a reasonable response to chemotherapy. It's short term, but if you're trying to get somebody to remission for allo, it, yeah, you can, you can do, I don't know, a few cycles of something and get them to remission, but send them for allo. But it's not, I'm not, I would not use it as a, as a line of treatment because I showed you the, it only works for a few months. But if you only have a small clone of 17P, even chemotherapy may work. But I, I think what we have been using in those patients, if you have no novel agent and there's no clinical trial or they're not eligible for trials, I think high dose methylpred and rituximab is, is a very effective treatment. And uh, we I have a question from Larry. Uh, he has raised his hand. Please, in the Hi. mic. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey. Hi, Dr. Shadman. And I, I wanted to thank you for your uh, great and comprehensive presentation. Um, as you know, uh, we uh, consider CLL uh, curable only with uh, allogenic transplant. Uh, I wanted to know if you have any uh, experience uh, according to uh, transplant uh, in CLL patients and what are the options for patients uh, who relapse uh, after allogenic transplant? Well, of course we have experience, as you said, uh, that's even now it's the only potentially curative treatment. We have published actually our experience. It's, uh, it was in one of my slides. We had uh, more than uh, 200 patients who got allotransplant for CLL and we had a overall survival rate of around 50% with a PFS of around 45%. So that's the experience. Uh, in the novel agent era, so patients who got transplant after having the new drugs, 
the numbers seem to be the same. And I, again, the, on the table in one of my slides, and I'm happy to share this slide or the review paper, the numbers seem to be the same. Now, what is the option for after transplant relapse? It depends on what they had before transplant. So if they have exhausted all the options, if they have failed BTK inhibitors or venetoclax and everything, then that's a difficult situation, right? Here we use CAR T cell, you know, clinical trials, things like that. But you know, if somebody relapses after allogeneic transplant and they have seen all the novel agents, that's 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 very difficult. That's another reason that we should not wait until our patients become double failure to referring to allo, right? So if they have only seen ibrutinib and they get allo and they relapse, they can go back on ibrutinib or they can go on venetoclax. So depending on what they had before, uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. And, and I would add, no, sure, uh, one thing, one of the things that we're now hoping for is to also cure CLL with the combination therapies. I didn't get a chance and I didn't wanna talk about it. It's, it's still experimental, but there are many studies that combining these drugs, I know I'm just, just for the sake of academic discussion, the remissions are so deep and we're hoping that maybe you can cure CLL with non-transplant methods, but you're right. At the moment, the transplant is the only curative option. Uh, you mean a combination of uh, two different classes? Right, yeah, there are many studies that mm -hmm. combine either. So venetoclax is always the backbone. There are studies at ASCO and EHA, we had the study, the Captivate study, it's a combination of ibrutinib and, I'm sorry, ibrutinib and venetoclax for one year and they have two cohorts. And there's a GLOW study that was presented yesterday. It's a randomized study combining ibrutinib with venetoclax in one arm and carambacil obinutuzumab. This study will most likely lead to a FDA approval for the combination. There are two national studies in the US, one finished accrual comparing uh, ibrutinib and venetoclax and obinutuzumab to only ibrutinib and obinutuzumab. There are two studies like that. We will soon open a, uh, start a study that com combines venetoclax and, and acalabrutinib. So there are many studies. So that's, that's kind of the thinking of maybe curing CLL with the combinations. Very well, thank you. Yep. Uh, Dr. Shadman, we have another question about the role of the lenoid as a maintenance treatment after chemoimmunotherapy in CLL patients. Very good Is there question. Any role? Yeah, there are studies actually by different groups uh, that in patients who received chemotherapy and finished chemotherapy based, based on their MRD status or if they had partial response, they were randomized to. LEN maintenance or not, and there was a PFS advantage to patients who received LEN maintenance. Uh, do we use it? No, but maybe because when that was added to the NCCN guidelines was around the time that ibrutinib became available. So in US, I can tell you, I don't think anybody does that. Uh, honestly, if even even if we didn't have access to the drugs, I don't know if I would use it as a maintenance after chemotherapy, but then alidomide is an active drug for CLL. So I may not use it as maintenance, but it's it's something that is, you know, there, there are many studies with lenalidomide. It never got approved for CLL because of the studies and the timing, and then we got these new drugs. So uh, yes, if there's no access to ibrutinib, and I know that len is more available, um, I think it's a reasonable option. It actually may be something else to use in even 17P patients. Again, the data is very limited. I'm not saying it's a standard, but uh, if there's no access, it's an active drug. I mean, tumor flare is something that, of course, we need to watch patients for. Um, yeah, so the company tried to use next generations of uh, IMIDs, uh, and some of them also failed in trials, but... Uh, yeah. So, no, I don't use it in maintenance. It's it's there. It was in the guidelines or still is, uh, but it's an active drug for CLO. And the, another question is about the role of the MRD status in CLL patient in routine clinical practice. Would you re recommend MRD? Great, great question. Gr great question. In routine clinical practice, no. I don't use MRD for any decisions. Well, the only situation that I use MRD for is post CAR T, but that's not considered routine clinical practice. So, what does it mean? Let's let's talk about ibrutinib, acalabrutinib. Do I care about MRD? No. If I'm the patient is in continuous therapy, 
they get partial response, MRD doesn't matter. MRD does matter with chemotherapy. When I give somebody six cycles of BR or FCR, if I do, and if they're MRD negative at the end, it's a predictive, it's, it's a prognostic marker. But if, if they're MRD positive, I don't act on it. That goes back to Dr. Tavakoli's question about LEN maintenance. Some, you know, the studies use LEN maintenance with MRD positives. I don't think I do or many do, but it's not wrong. I mean, there's a study then it's published. For venetoclax, it's a big question is about venetoclax. Do you act on MRD after one year? If they're MRD positive after one year, there is a lot of discussions. There are colleagues who may tell you, yes, I will continue venetoclax until they're MRD negative, but who knows if they will ever be MRD negative? Who knows how long it takes for them to MRD negative? So I, the, 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 the board answer, the classic, the evidence-based answer is not to use MRD at the moment but there are many clinical trials that are using MRD guided approaches and that may change. But at the moment, I don't use MRD in standard in clinical practice. Um, and, uh, and is uh, another question is about the response criteria in ibratinib treated patients. Uh, when we try to use ibratinib, the cytosis count is increased and uh, how we define that the patients responded to ibrutinib? Very good question. Ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, zanobrutinib, idelolisib, duvelisib, umbralisib, they all cause this lymphocytosis. All b cell receptor inhibitors, they cause the lymphocytosis. So we just ignore that. As long as everything else is in the right direction, so if lymph nodes are getting smaller, patient usually feels better, their platelet count is coming up, their neutrophil count is getting better, their anemia is improving, but their lymphocyte count goes up from 20 to 50. We just ignore it. So we just, uh, it, I can tell you it can go up. I had a patient started at 600,000 and went up to more than a million. And we were having a heart attack, not knowing what, because then I mean, it's super high number, right? I mean, what if something happens to the patient, but nothing happens. So these, these are normal looking lymphocytes. So basically ignore that as long as everything else is in the right direction. Response criteria, they call it PRL, PR-L in partial response with lymphocytosis, but that's just for clinical trial purposes. It will come back down and it could come, doesn't matter how soon it returns to normal. It doesn't impact the overall outcome. We know that. I think there's a question and about- how you, uh, And how would you define refractory patient how long uh, would you uh, let the patient give uh, take ibrutinib and then define he, uh, the patient is ibrutinib refractory? How long does it take that the lymph nodes become smaller or the anemia become uh, there? Yeah, I, I, honestly, ibrutinib refractory is extremely rare. So if it's truly mm -hmm. CLL, it works. The median time to response is two months, but the reason it's two months is because in trials, they didn't look before two months. The first scan that patients usually get on a clinical trial is at two months. So every new agent you look at, the median time to response is two months because nobody looks before. But in practice, lymph nodes get smaller, usually in the, as you know, I mean, you use ibrutinib. So in the first two or three weeks, you see responses. But of course, if, if I go for a month or two and I still don't see a response, that makes me question the diagnosis. Is it Richter's? Am I missing something in biopsy? And maybe I'm not treating CLO. If in patients who respond, any minor change in the lymphocyte count, I would take very seriously. So somebody on ibrutinib for a year and their lymphocyte count is coming up, I would definitely check for resistance mutations. I would watch them very closely. Those are not type of a patients that you watch until their lymphocyte. I mean, I, immediately I would switch them to something else. And uh, I think it's that about the Richter transformation in these patients. How would you recommend the treatment of Richter transformation? Yeah, Richter's is, uh, we didn't talk about Richter. So if we, I don't know if we can check for clonality uh, to see if this, so in patients who are previously treated for CLL and they have large cell lymphoma. Let, let me start with Hodgkin. So there's a Richter's to Hodgkin lymphoma, right? So Richter's to Hodgkin, you basically treat them like Hodgkin. So you give them the ABVD or whatever, and you don't transplant them because their outcomes is very similar to de novo Hodgkin. So that's for Hodgkin Richter's. For 
non-Hodgkin Richters, uh, most of the time, these are clonally related to CLL, 80% of the time. So the goal is to get them to remission and then do a transplant. So how to get them to remission? It's with our chop based chemotherapy or our EPOC, anthracycline-based chemo. The, the chance of achieving a complete response is around 30 to 40%, unfortunately, but that's why Richter's is an unmet need for, for us in terms of research. But you just try to get them to a remission and you either do an auto transplant or allogeneic transplant. Um, if there are 17P and you, know, you, you do wanna go with allo, but at least an auto. There is a paper coming out from CIBMTR. They looked at both auto and allo and in patients who get to transplant, their outcomes are pretty reasonable. But yeah, so chemotherapy, send to transplant, allo, if not, if not at least an auto, if you can collect them and if their bone marrow is negative. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I think that Dr. Yagmai's time is over and uh, I think there's a question about TCL. Yeah, question about, but, is, it, uh, yeah. is it TPLL yeah. probably or TCLL? Uh, I think if it's, well, if, if I don't know, I don't know that about TCLL, but I mean, there are few T cell lymphomas that can cause lymphocytosis that, you know, the most common one would be TPLL and you have LGL and you have, uh, you know, uh, Cesare syndrome. I mean, for TPLL, the, I think we had a case as, you know, we, try to use CAMPAT and uh, followed by allotransplant. There are some other agents that are also active uh, uh, case reports with, uh, I mean, bendamustin seems to have some activity, pentostatin, venetoclax we, we use sometimes. There's recent data that ruxolotinib may add to venetoclax, but really it's CAMPAT followed by transplant if possible. That's TPLL though. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Shadaman. I have a question about the role of rituximab in maintenance treatment of uh, patients treated with immuno, uh, immunochemotherapy or venetoclax plus uh, rituximab. The role of rituximab in maintenance treatment of patients with chronic lymphocytic locality. Yeah, very good question. So there are studies that looked at both rituximab and ofatumumab, which we don't use anymore, but another CD20 antibody maintenance in patients who finished, let's say, bendamustine rituximab or even F. I think the study was in the relapse setting, so it was mainly BR. And again, in those who didn't achieve a complete remission, they got randomized to rituximab or nothing, and there was a progression-free survival advantage of using rituximab. I, I don't know if I, I, that's not something that I do or we, I don't think we do. Uh, we don't use maintenance rituximab after chemotherapy for CLL. I, I, we don't even use it for follicular lymphoma where there's much stronger evidence. The reason for that is it only improves progression-free survival. It comes with toxicity, cytopenias, infections, of course. It's, it's expensive. Um, and especially with the COVID and the, all the data with the you know, effectiveness of vaccine in CD20 exposed, antibody exposed patients. Uh, so yeah, the, we don't use maintenance for. For venetoclax, as I showed, venetoclax both in the first line and relapse is given with a CD20 antibody, either obinutuzumab or rituximab. I know there's no obinutuzumab in Iran. I don't think, I think rituximab uh, uh, venetoclax makes perfect sense in the first line. We actually used a lot of it even for the first line. Uh, the reason we use rituximab instead of obinutuzumab is because of the subcutaneous injection form of rituximab that it's, we have and it's much easier for patients. So even in the first line, it's not, it's not evidence-based or a study, but it, I mean, you, can, you can use venetoclax with rituximab, but it's only for six months. So to use it as a maintenance, again, I don't, uh, no, we don't use. Thank you. Yeah, sure. If we have uh, time, as uh, there is another of the venetoclax treatment in the setting of the patient active infectious, active infection, yeah. especially fungal infection. Is it safe to use venetoclax in this setting? 
You mean to continue of an interclax in somebody who has fungal infection, right? Intercalation, yeah, no, yes. I, 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 no, we, so, uh, venetoclax and its impact on T cell and NKs is not, so with ibrutinib, we have data that after one year of the treatment, you actually improve the T cell profile and it may be actually helpful for, for infections. Although both for BTK inhibitors and venetoclax, if somebody has an infection like fungal infection, we hold the drug. Now, the, the issue is it could be a fungal infection that you have to post, let's say post transplant, you have to keep somebody on voriconazole. And you know, if it's be, as long as the infection is controlled and they have to be an antifungal maybe for a long time, you just, there is a strong interaction and you have to adjust the dose of venetoclax. But in the active infection, I would definitely hold venetoclax. The only exception for holding these drugs during an active infection is COVID-19 and drugs like ibrutinib. We, we continue ibrutinib during the COVID-19 infection. There are some studies showing that both ibrutinib and acalabrutinib may, may in fact have some protective effects on the hyperinflammatory phase of COVID-19. Actually, when they get to the, the later phases, uh, BTK inhibitors may be actually helpful. So for all my patients with COVID-19 who were on one of these drugs, I continued ibrutinib or xanabrutinib or acala, but venetoclax, I definitely stopped. Thank you very much for nice presentation and the interactive session. Sure. Thank you everyone My for pleasure. joining us to this hall retreat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sharma. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rashafi and uh, Dr. Yagmay for a nice presentation organization uh, and uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, everybody that participate in this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you.